everybody. Good afternoon. I switch gears a little bit. Our theme for the uh, day today is think outside. So I invite you to think about some outside experiences that you've had with one of Ontario's so-called dangerous wildlife uh, black bears. Black bears are often in the news. They're always getting themselves into trouble. They're into a dumpster behind a restaurant. They've got into somebody's garbage bag. Or they're trying to break into a cottage, or very rarely there's a, a black bear attack on people. And the very first question that is often asked is, what's with the bears anyway? So what I'd like to take you on in the next few minutes is a journey through the biology of black bears that tries to answer that question. And first, I'd like you to take a really good look at the face of this big old male black bear. Get an impression of what he looks like in your mind, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes about why that's important. So their journey will be a look at the ecological evolutionary drivers that predispose black bears to come into conflict with humans. What is it about their biology that sets them up that they are eventually going to become a problem in their interactions with us? And why it's us that has to change, and the flip side of that, why the bears can't change. So bears evolved in uh, deciduous forests of eastern North America. If we have an understanding of how black bears exploit those resources in the forest, we have a pretty good insight into their ecology and into their behavior. And what I've learned over the years is it's all about food. It's food that drives that whole system. Their, their attempts to access food. So let's look at the kinds of things that bears feed on. And let's ask the question, do the things they feed on vary from season to season? And if they do, what are the implications of that? Do the things they feed on vary from year to year? And if they do vary from year to year, what are the implications of that for the biology of bears, and perhaps even more importantly, for human bear conflict? So first, kinds of things that bears feed on, openings in the forest when they come out of the dens, grasses, horsetails, sedges, dandelions, clover, even big males like this, you can find feeding on clover. You notice that this guy's got a clover flower hanging out of his mouth. Any of you have a farming background? You know that when farmers go to cut their hay, they cut it around the time that clover starts to flower, and that's when hay has its highest protein content. I had a grad student several years ago who looked at the nutrient content of all the various vegetation types that bears fed on, and they always fed on them when they had their highest protein content. Spring, you may find bears that have creeks in their home ranges where suckers run, feeding on spawning suckers. Occasionally, bears will take moose calves. We had a study in Algonquin Park a few years ago that showed about 8% of moose calves were predated by bears. So it can be an important protein source for a few bears. And around the same time of year, you can find bears high up in the aspen trees. What are they doing? Well, like this bear, they're using their lips, which, which are free from their uh, skull and, and their lower jaw, to pluck at those leaves and strip the leaves off the branches. As you can see the branches here, she stripped, it's a radio collared female in one of our studies, she stripped all those leaves off. And again, the message is the same, that that's the time of year when protein content is highest in aspen leaves. You don't find bears feeding on aspen in, in August because protein content has dropped off dramatically and also there's a buildup of cellulose and lignin in the cell walls and it's more difficult for bears to digest food. They have a simple gut like ours. They have no bacterial flora and fauna to help them digest cellulose. So now we get into the time of year, perhaps late May, early June, and this is a, a male that's been marking this jack pine. And what he's done is he's taken these claws and he's dragged them down like this in, in the jack pine, starts the sap running, and he turns his back to that tree and he rubs his shoulders in the sap like this and rubs up and down like this, and he's leaving hair behind and scent, and he's marking his territory. And what he's saying is, I'm a male that lives here, and I want all you other males to stay away because I want access to the resources. And the most important resource that he's after is females. It's around the time that females start uh, being receptive. In this shot, we've got two bears. This is an adult female, 16 years old, with her back to the camera. This is a young male, six years old. She's a proven breeder, had several litters in the past. He's a young male who would like to be a proven breeder. He's physiologically mature, producing sperm and so on. 
And uh, I don't think you can see it very well, but her vulva is quite red and inflamed and swollen. She's dumping a pheromone trail out into the environment, attracting males to her. I'm receptive, I'm willing to mate with you, provided that I'm satisfied that you're of sufficient quality that I do want to mate with you. And how is she assessing the quality of this male? With this wrestling match. Well, I watched this uh, pair over two or three days, and the male repeatedly tried to overpower her in this wrestling match and whip her around behind so that he could mate. And what did she do? Sat down. And so <laughs> said, no, thank you. You're not good enough. Until Scarface, the fellow that I showed you in that first slide, came along. A big old dominant male, over 400 pounds, a couple of woofs from Scarface and this young guy head for the hills, and I watched Scarface and this uh, female go into the same kind of wrestling um, bout. She was assessing his quality, presumably, and uh, accepted him, and we knew from our genetics work that he was, in fact, the father of her litter a few, uh, the next winter. So what's going on here is female choice. Female blackbirds are choosing who they want to mate with. So in summary, that period from den emergence up into early July across Black Bear Range, Food items vary a little bit in timing from year to year, but the aspens are always going to uh, flush out. Grass is always going to be there, and, and the suckers are always going to spawn. Bears feed on a whole different variety of feed, uh, green vegetation throughout the, the summer, when it has its highest protein, through the spring rather, when it has highest protein content. Males spend a lot of energy patrolling their home range. They may have a home range that overlaps with eight or ten females, and maybe half of them will actually be receptive. And the male is patrolling, trying to find all of these, and so on. So does size matter? Well, it does if you're a male black bear, because it's the big males that get the breeding opportunities. Males fight vigorously o over this period of time, as evidenced by all those scars on Scarface's face. He'd been in a lot of battles over his years and fathered a lot of uh, cubs. Large males are the ones that get the breeding opportunities. Males can father more than one litter in a year, actually, because they will patrol their home range and look for several females. So, yes, there is evolutionary pressure to be a large male. Now, how do you get to be a large male? Well, you grow like mad when you're a subadult male. And how do you grow like mad? You access food as much as you possibly can. If that natural food in the environment is not available, you're going to try and access human sources of food. So this is a really important point, that in years of food failure, young males are almost certainly going to get themselves in trouble with people, because they're going to be trying to access that, that anthropogenic so source of food. But all bears will do that. All right, so let's go now to the period from summer on. Mostly feeding on berries, until the fall comes when they're feeding largely on, on nut crops. Raspberries, in this case, blueberries, and this plant here, bristly sarsaparilla, this is a shot from the boreal forest, so these openings, sand areas in the boreal forest are really important for bears. Here's a, a bear here feeding in the middle of a regenerating japline stand. Stand that had been cut, timber had been harvested, it's been replanted in jackpine, but blueberries are starting to cover the whole floor, forest floor because blueberry plants were always there. They were, but they were shaded out by that overstory of jack pine. Once the overstory is removed, blueberries can flourish and the bears will enjoy themselves there. And of course, this is the natural uh, way of producing that, a forest fire that's gone through here. Five years later, what does that area look like? All the dead standing timber, but a huge carpet of blueberries all over the forest floor, and you can see the regenerating, natural regeneration of jack pine in the foreground here. So this is a naturally created food patch. The bears go out in the summer, wandering around, they find these food patches. They have tremendous learning abilities, they're highly intelligent animals, they have phenomenal navigational abilities. So bears have the ability to return to their home range, remember where this food patch is, come back to it next year, and the year after, and the year after, and these patches could be available for as much as eight or ten years until the regenerating jackpine um, crowds out the blueberries again. So what's the lesson for us in terms of human bear conflict? Well, what if that food patch was a dumpster, dumpster behind a restaurant? What if it was your garbage container at the end of your driveway? Bears have that same ability to learn where those food sources are and to visit them repeatedly and exploit them if they can, unless the attractants are removed. So they have the ability to generalize from the natural situation to that situation that involves humans and gets them into human bear conflict. 
And does blackberry production vary from year to year? Well, absolutely it does. We monitor blueberry production in our boreal fodder study over many years. It can vary at two orders of magnitude. Some years you might have less than a kilogram per hectare of blueberries. Other years you might have between 10 and 100 kilograms per hectare. Bears also feed in the summer on ants. They dig up bumblebee nests. But generally by August, they're feeding on the berry crops again. In this case, pinch cherry. Choke cherry, which is really abundant this year in Algonquin area. All the various dog foot woods, some are available in June, some in August. And in the boreal forest, by about this time of year, in many years, bears are back to feeding on grasses. Unless there's been a really good mountain ash crop, in which case bears will exploit that mountain ash crop in the fall. And mountain ash persists on the trees well after leaf fall. So bears can often stay out of their dens for a full month feeding on this natural food source. And in this part of the world, beech, of course, clearly showing evidence of a bear having climbed it, looking for beech nuts. And here's an adult male high up in a beech tree, feeding on beech. And not only do they eat beech, but also acorns. And bears have that same ability to learn where beech and oak stands are, and even migrate outside of areas like Algonquin Park to those oak stands to feed on them year after year after year during their whole lifestyle. And probably females pass that knowledge on to their offspring as well because they will take cubs with them when they go. So does food vary? Well, here's some data from our boreal forest study. Look at in year one, some blueberry production, phenomenal blueberry production in year two, nothing in year three. Mountain ash, kind of the opposite pattern. Nothing in year one and two, but quite a high production in year three. So if one food crop fails, another food crop might compensate for that. But notice that there are going to be some years when both are really low. Blueberries were low here and no mountain ash. So there are yum some years when food is going to fail entirely. And here's a little bit more data to look at. We have uh, ministry been monitoring wildlife food over many years. Look how it goes up and down from year to year. What I'd really like you to focus on is the difference between the food and problem bear occurrences. And notice how they're di diametrically opposite. When food is good in the environment, as it is this year, problem bear occurrences are really low. When food drops off, problem bear occurrences skyrocket. It's a really tight relationship. When natural food fails, we have elevated problem bear conflicts. Well, eventually, it comes time to den up. There's no more natural food left in the environment, and bears go into their dens. So in summary, that summer and fall period, food is highly variable from one year to the next. Sometimes one food item can compensate for another. Sometimes food varies by several orders of magnitude. But one of the consequences is that it can, if the food fails, it can result in reproductive failure. So where does food have this effect? Well, it determines, first of all, what female reproductive, reproductive success is. It can affect cub survival. It affects survival of independent yearlings and subadults. It can also result in breeding synchrony. So if food fails one year, all the females that were available to mate pass up that opportunity. And then a year later, maybe you have a large year class born. And that itself can elevate human bear conflicts. So does size matter for females? We already talked about how it matters for males. Tremendous pressure to be a big male, yes. There is pressure to be a large female because large females breed at an earlier age. They have higher reproductive success because their cubs survive better and their yearlings survive better. As a consequence, they leave more genes behind in the population. Ecological drivers, this variability in summer and fall food. Yet that's the time when bears need to gain that body mass, but they're under tremendous pressure because it varies from one year to the next. So there is this evolutionary pressure. Large males get the breeding opportunities. Large females have higher reproductive success. So in summary, the bears can't help themselves. They're driven by their biology to feed as much as they can in any given year. If natural food fails, there's nothing they can do about that but they will get out there and exploit other food sources, whatever they may be. If they're uncontrolled uh, garbage, that's what they're gonna get into. So quickly, uh, look at a little bit of information here. This is uh, sources of all human bear conflict in Ontario in the year 2011. Pie chart, 27% household garbage, 12% commercial garbage, 27% landfill. Two thirds of human bear conflicts in the province of Ontario were related to improperly stored garbage. 
which is something by definition we don't value and we don't want. So if we could somehow affect that human bear dyad by controlling whether bears have access to our garbage, we could reduce some human bear conflict in the, in the province by two thirds. And if you don't think that bears are persistent in getting access to food sources, this is an adult male in Sudbury a few years who's making his way out along this clothesline. He's about a 300 pound bear. And he did actually make it to that seed feeder. So what can you do? So I encourage you to think outside the box. Think outside, but think outside the box. Don't blame the bears for that human bear conflict diet. There's nothing they can do about it. But we do have the ability to change our behavior. In a parks context, we can install uh, bear resistant food lockers in campgrounds. If you're camping in back country, you can make absolutely sure that your food barrel is hung well. Bears don't have access to it. And then lastly, call me a dreamer, I guess, but it's my hope that if we can encourage people in society in general to take ownership of their side of the human bear conflict equation, that someday for most of us in our society, scenes like this will not only be tolerated, but they'll be embraced. Thanks very much. <laughs>